This is Ryan, the host of the Mad Data Podcast, where we talk to experts just like you that are using machine learning, AI, and of course, data to transform their business. So join us as we highlight the stories that are shaping the fields of data engineering, science, and analytics, both for today and the future. Well, hey, everyone. Welcome back to another edition of the Mad Data Podcast. Uh, I'm Ryan, one of the hosts over here. We also have Josh from Databand, our CEO. And then we also have a another Philadelphian. Is that right? Philadelphian? Is that how I yes. say that right? Yeah. Philadelphia. Philly head. Philly. Philly head. Philly head. Uh, Josh is in Philly. And we have uh, Tristan Handy, who's the CEO and co-founder over at DBT Labs. Tristan, how are you doing over there in Philadelphia? I'm doing all right. Thanks for having me. Um, do you want to get your Philadelphia plug in, Josh, before we get going on the topic? I know you really wanted to uh, to plug this in. Yes, please. Um, I'm actually pretty new to Philly. I, I moved here from New York about a year ago. I think, Tristan, you've, you've been around for a little while longer. So I, I'd love to hear like what you think of the Philly tech community so far, the data community here, what's keeping you around and um, some thoughts on the future. I've been here for just shy of 10 years. I moved here to work at a company called RJ Metrics, uh, which was uh, kind of just predated the modern data stack and and brought a bunch of data talent into Philly. Um, I I am still here because within uh, within a month of moving to the city, you know, like you do, I got on an online dating app, and the second person that I met, I'm now married to, um, and she was based in Philadelphia. She works at, at a big hospital here. And she was like, I have the greatest job in the world. I'm never moving. Um, and so here I still am today. Um, but, it, but it's actually like a part of our, our story as a company. You know, I, I was like trying to figure out my next data job and the Philly startup ecosystem was not actually in such a great place in the 2015, 2016 time period. Like there were, there were some companies that were were promising and have since grown a lot um but uh it it certainly uh was was not uh, that kind of like market liquidity on the talent side that you would see in like a New York or San Francisco so uh was was actually forced kind of almost unwillingly to to start my own thing yeah and how much of of DBT labs now is actually in Philly i think it's like 8% so so f- at the outset, we were all or at the outset, we were all like ex RJ people. The first four of us were, we had all worked together. Um, and then we, you know, there's, there's great schools here. We hired some people out of um, Penn and other, other schools in the area. Um, and we, as we started to build up our engineering team, we, we had, we'd kind of like seen this play out before the the talent for software engineers is like there's there's fantastic software engineers in Philly, but there's actually not like that many of them, um, and and so we just adopted from the very outset like hey if we're gonna grow a software engineering team of any size like we're gonna have to be distributed, and we made that decision back in 2018, you know two full years before the world kind of decided that we were all distributed. Um, so, you know, going into the pandemic, we were, I don't know, 75% of us were still in Philly and now it's 8% of us. Um, and we, you know, have, have people throughout the continental U S and in Europe and Asia Pacific. Uh, what I thought was really interesting was that, uh, you had mentioned that your spouse worked at a hospital and that's why you're in Philadelphia. Isn't that the same thing? What's going on with you, Josh? Yeah, that's actually why I'm here as well. <laughs> completely, right. I didn't like, know that. Um, works at a hospital. She completely, yeah, finagled me out of New York to, to come over here. But um, I'm happy about the move. Some completely unreasonable percentage of the Philadelphia economy is healthcare and education. I mean, it just, it's like everything. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But um, we love it. Um, and to the yeah, handful of tech people in Philly, shout out to everybody and ping me if you want to grab a beer somewhere at some point. Um, also, shout out to Jake Stein, RJ Metrics and his new company, uh, Common Paper, which we're big fans of. 
So we, we like this little Philly tech mafia that's beginning to, uh, to form out here. Tech mafia. I like that. I like that. <laughs> um, well, Tristan, before we get into the topic today, which is discussing kind of the, the modern data team, and we have the subtopic around symmetric layer we're going to get into as well. You're just going to give us a, a background yourself. You know, how do you got into co-founding DBT Labs? Like, what's a day in the life of Tristan like? I know that uh, you do a lot of keynotes and speaking and nowadays, but kind of give us a little bit of background on, on how you got to where you're at. Yeah, the worst thing is that now when people ask you to speak at a conference, they expect you to go somewhere in person. It's terrible. I know. I was, <laughs> I was really into speaking at conferences when it just meant that I could open up a, a Zoom window. Um so my my story is that I've now been a data practitioner for, uh, depending on how you measure it, like probably a little over 20 years. Um, I, I got a job even back in like high school as the kid who knew Excel. And, you know, I was, this is in like the late 90s and I'm surrounded by a bunch of civil engineers who needed to create Excel spreadsheets, but in order to like add multiple cells together, they would like pull out their calculator and then type in the results on the, you know, the results tab. They didn't actually know about formulas. Um, so I became like the, the kid in the office who knew how to do spreadsheets. And it turns out that like, you can kind of push that for a long way as, you know, a, an early, very early career professional. Um, I like did that in college and I, parlayed that into, uh, you know, if, if anyone listening has, has been a management consultant, um, you know, that's essentially the entire job description is like making very complicated Excel workbooks. So, uh, I, I, that, that was like kind of my way into data. And then, um, at in, in my consulting early consulting career, I got, uh, I got exposed to building systems. So this is back in the era where like government agencies would pay big consulting firms millions of dollars to like build simple web systems. Um, and now you could like throw these things together with like Ruby on Rails or Django and like a team of two people for a couple sprints. But uh, back then it was like this major undertaking. And um, so I, I got put in charge of a big data conversion effort from a 40 year old mainframe into uh, a system that certified all teachers in the state of New York. And it was like my first real exposure to, you know, enterprise data. You know, I used the whole suite of Oracle products. I like ran a small team of people to do this, this work. It was like really so, so cool. Um, I like learned to think and sleep in SQL. Um, I, uh, I was like, it, it was the first time where I was like, this is a thing that I'm really good at and could imagine doing for a long time. Um, but the the career path there is like not, at least was at the time was like not at all clear. Um, data people didn't have this standard career path that like software engineers have, where you continue to build up your skills, you continue to get promotions and pay more money. Like oftentimes, if you're really good at doing data work, that just meant that somebody. Some like some executive was gonna make you like their quote unquote their person. They, you were gonna like sit in the corner. You were gonna like make reports for them forever, and they were never gonna let you do anything but that. Um, it's like the opposite of a good career path. And so, I you know I it was clear that I didn't want to do that. And you know I got into the startup world, and in the startup world, when you 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 very quickly learn that like you need to learn how to do things, not just know stuff. So. Um, you, uh, I, I like had to learn how to do ops and marketing and have had leadership roles in those areas. Um, but like those are still, you know, if you've, if you've been a VP marketing before you, you realize that like a big chunk of that job is, is data. Um, and so I, I was like really good at the data part of marketing and I was kind of bad at the rest of it. Well, I appreciate you, uh, saying that marketing should be a data driven practitioner because I'm in marketing. So I appreciate you saying that. <laughs> Uh, no, I, I think that the whole marketing angle, cause you can, cause from there, from, from marketing, from your past job, you know, correct me if you're wrong, before you got founded going into DBT, your last job wasn't marketing, right? Or was it not? It wasn't marketing. And it, I, I had at that point had marketing related roles for seven years and 
you know, I, uh, marketing was the thing that I'm very happy to have learned how to do a reasonable job of. Um, but it wasn't the thing that got me out of bed every morning. It wasn't like, you know, you can only force yourself to do something that is not your passion for for so long. Apparently, that length of time for me was seven years. Um, but but you know, as RJ Metrics was kind of like winding its way to completion for me, um, I had to figure out what my next thing was, and, and it was definitely data. The question was, how do I? How did I get? get back into this in a way that was satisfying and was not like stuck in this not good career progression like I was talking about before. And so I really saw this as as two things. One, like what opportunities were unlocked by the new data technology that was, you know, had had come out in the early 2010s. So this is like Amazon Redshift and Looker and Mode. Um tools like Stitch and Fivetran. Um, so like, it was clear to me that like practitioners with my type of skill set now had a lot more power than we had a decade prior. Um, but, but then it also like required a new workflow, a new like way of using these tools. Um, the, we, we had all these new superpowers, but like we didn't really know what to do with them or how to, how to like actually take this and, uh, tr transform it into like a systemic practice, um, and and so that's that's what I tried to bring to, um, to to the doing of the thing. And I, and in order to, I mean, one we talked about it because like I, the the job market in Philly didn't support me doing this as a part of a larger company. But I also wanted to have the space to experiment and uh, figure out how to do this work for myself. So I started a consulting company and it was supposed to just be me. It was called Fishtown Analytics. And uh, DBT at the time was kind of, it was a consulting delivery tool. It was like just something that I knew that I needed in order to like deliver consulting work. Um, so that's that's kind of the roots and everything at the beginning was about like how do I efficiently do this type of analytics work in this new tooling stack that, that not that many people knew how to use back in 2016. Did you have the ambition or interest in building a product company out of this consultancy or was it more by accident? I had always worked in, in my like start in my time at startups, I had always worked at product companies. Um, and so I, I love the idea of um, building useful things that you know, scale and, you know, scale well beyond like the number of hours in your day, which is ultimately like where you can get in consulting. Um, but I was, I was also very, I felt very burned out by the, the venture funded route. Um, I had been in three startups. Um, all of the, they, they, there had been like a mixed bag in terms of like how successful we had been. And, um, there was just a lot of overwork and excessive focus on KPIs, uh, KPI achievement at all costs. There was a lot of this like not good part of startups too. And so I, I actually really was resistant to the idea of creating a product focused company at first um, because I didn't want to subject myself to all of those kind of like negative pressures that, that I had seen um, in, in the past. And, and that's why, like, it, it turns out that if you wait and if you can, rather than, you know, day one, I have an idea, let's go raise money. Okay. Now you're on the clock. You don't have any users. You don't have any revenue. You have nothing, but you have a bunch of VC sitting in a bank account. There's like a tremendous amount of pressure in that scenario. That's not what we did we put this off for three and a half years while we bootstrapped the business and like tried to figure out if this is something we wanted to do. But by the time that we did eventually go down the product company route, the VC funded route, we had a thousand companies using DBT every week. And we had like meaningful, uh, meaningful product revenue and like customer count changes, changes the, the dynamic there. Yeah. So today in DBT, how does the, heritage of consultant work and bootstrapping affect how you run the company now 
or how the product looks now, how you interfa- interface with customers? Like, wh- what's the what are the downstream effects on that for you today? There's a couple of different long lasting um, impacts there. I think the the biggest one is the DBT community. Um, the DBT community originally was it, it was actually called Analyst Collective. There was like a logo for it. It was it was not focused on DBT. It was just like a place for people doing this kind of work to hang out together and and talk about um, you know best practices and commiserate. And you know, Drew and I and later Connor and Aaron were just like more people in this Slack channel, like t- talking with everybody else. Um, and over time, it became a- as DBT grew in popularity and th- this became a place where people could get support, could talk to each other about best practices, that kind of stuff. Um, it we, we actually did change it to being explicitly, this is the DBT community. Um, but I think that th- there's been a lot of observations about how um, the DBT community feels different than a lot of um, communities that arise around a software product. And I think that's really because, I mean, one, it's because this thing is open source and uh, that gives users a different relationship to it than uh, if this were a commercial product. But but also it's from the legacy of, you know, we, we intentionally, when we rebranded the company from Fishtown Analytics to DBT Labs, there, was a, there were a lot of folks who were, who said, why don't you just call the company DBT? Um, you know, the, the, you know, uh, Looker is a product and Looker is also a company. Like you don't typically, it's, it's very common to like call the product and the company the same thing. Um, we were very uncomfortable with that. Um, we are not DBT. DBT is a product and there's also a community around DBT. We are the company who primarily maintains DBT, but we are not ourselves DBT. We're DBT labs. Um, so I think that this, this like community dynamic, um, would, could only really have arisen in an environment where like we're peers out there. We're like figuring out how to do this work all together. So there's really to the topic of this distinction between the product and the company, I, I can imagine how your heritage coming from consultancy helps crystallize that distinction because the organization is the people, the people deliver the service. You invented the product to help you deliver the service and now you have a product, but really it's the people in your, in your company that make up the organization. Um, when I think of your organization, DBT Labs, there's really two things that I think about for, as an outsider. One is DBT and the other one is analytics engineering. And that being an area and a term and a role that uh, I've seen your company really um, really champion within the market and, and uh, in large ways invent. So I'm curious if you see, you know, it, it sounds like you're framing DBT as one of potentially many products that you may ultimately deliver, if I'm reading that correctly, um, is how do you view analytics engineering in that in that context? Is that one of many roles that you see yourself delivering to, or is that more of a, a centralization, a, a point of centralization for your company? Yeah. I, okay. This is, this is a great topic. The, um, I'm going to try hard to, to say useful things because my brain starts spiraling off because this is such a big topic. That's what happens when Josh asks me about marketing. <laughs> the same thing happens to me. I just start, I just start saying a bunch of stuff and then I'm like, you good? Okay. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Help me stay single threaded. If yeah. If, if you need. Okay. What, what is analytics engineering in the first place? How is it different than data engineering? How is it different than analytics? Um, the, I, and I, I, I don't know if it is a perfect term, um, but the the reason that I think this term came to mean something was that there, the his, historically the process of analyzing data, as done by people who often call themselves data analysts, um, was uh, very bespoke. Every time you asked a discrete question, a data analyst would kind of start from scratch and would you know go find the data needed 
um, would go through the whole analytical process when it output an answer. And um, the, the problem with that is that organizations tend to want to add new information inputs and ask new analytical questions over time. And if every time you want the answer to a new question, it takes the complete span of that, that you have to do all of those steps of the process, you find that your pace slows down and down and down over time because you wanted that dashboard last week, but you want it again this week. And so do you want this same data analyst to be just all, like literally my entire job is producing three dashboards and I do that once a week and that's all I can do. Um, th that like legitimately is how a lot of data analysts spent their time prior to analytics engineering. Um, the analytics engineering asks you to apply engineering principles to this workflow. Um, so, and, and rather than thinking about it as engineering analytics, I actually think about it as engineering knowledge or knowledge flow through an organization. So rather than like this bespoke uh, trade craft process whereby a data analyst, the expert goes out into the field and you know, does detective work. Instead, you say like, okay, what's the information flowing into our company? How do I make sure to make it available in a place where everybody can access it? How do I make sure to make it available in a format that is comprehensible, that is documented? Um, then how do I make sure to structure that information in increasingly intelligible ways? So instead of having to go to eight different systems with eight different customers tables, how do I make sure to organize that all into a single customers table so that I can, you know, I or any, anybody else that wants to ask questions about customers can just go to this one table and do this. So it's like applying these successively higher order abstractions um, on top of the, the like raw data that comes into your organization such that the asking of these analytical questions can happen with greater and greater velocity over time. And not just greater and greater velocity, but like more, um, more people can participate in that, in that process because the, we're, we're actually uh, constraining the surface area that they have to work across. How's that for a starting point? Yeah. Let me, let me try to disentangle my wiry question there. So um, the, it, it sounded like from, so you explained how you were, um, how you don't view DBT as synonymous with the company, right? Um, are you telegraphing there that you may roll out new products on top of DBT? We're focused on the practice of analytics engineering. Um, now, I say I say it that way because I, there are there are people who their actual job title is the analytic and, and analytics engineer, and that's great. And there's a lot of um, you know a, a lot of them use DBT and wonderful. Um, there's also a lot of people who use DBT, who their job title is not analytics engineer. Um, you know, there are people who primarily spend them, their, their time um, in the lower level, like data engineering work. There's people who spend most of their time in the higher level uh, data analyst work. And, but, but they, they also participate in the analytics engineering workflow. Um, so that's, that's where we are primarily focused. Okay. And that might be other tools in addition to DBT in the future. I can't see, you know, in, in the, the complete fullness of time, but like right now, I think it's safe to say that like, we're extremely focused on DBT. Yeah. Yeah, of course. So, um, but the, the scenario here is like, if the critical mass of analytics engineers, however you're drawing that mm -hmm. demographic, if your read on them was that their needs have shifted from like the core capabilities that DBT is covering into some new domain, into some new territory because of some changes in the market, the technology ecosystem, the needs of these folks, then you would move with the demands of that 
demographic of the analytics engineers, and that might take you in totally new product directions. It could be data ingestion. It could be closer to monitoring. It could be closer to um, different types of workflows that may go outside of like that core DBT uh, capability zone. Am I am I understanding you correctly? Yeah, I think that's fair. I I want to stay away from saying like uh, <laughs> like I very specifically don't ever want to build a data ingestion product. Um, I'm on record as saying that in the past. I will say it again here. I also don't want to ever build a BI product. Um, I will retire before I uh, before we build a <laughs> BI product. Um, but um, you're you're correct in saying that we're more focused on the needs of this persona than we are in specific product surface area. Um, and this is a conversation that I know you and I have had before the, the, um, the thing about DBT, you know, you, you take, uh, a, an orchestrator like airflow. Um, the thing about airflow is that you can do really essentially anything that you want in airflow. Um, it, it provides you a set of tools that you can kind of use in, in whatever way you choose. DBT is actually very opinionated about the the workflow that it wants to see you go through. It is it is about enabling a specific workflow. Um, and I, I think um, we have seen it at the outset, this was like at the outset, like in 2016, 2017, it, our, our opinions, you know, things like, you know, bring the code to the data, not the data to the code. Um, things like SQL is uh, the language that most data transformation workloads should be expressed in, like, et cetera. Like all of these things were like extremely controversial in the 2016, 2017 time horizon. And they are becoming less controversial. Um, and I think over time, um, we'll find that actually analytics engineering is not this like subset of all workflows. It's like a framework to think about how, you know, appreciably all knowledge flows through organizations, at least all quantitative knowledge. And just on this, this topic of, of DBT and airflow, something that we did catch in, I think a recent product, uh, product uh, blog or, or publication you put out around the new Python language DBT models, which seems to be moving closer into Airflow's territory. Um, I can see why you would say that. Um, to us, the the real question, I, and I referenced this a second ago, um, we believe in ELT instead of ETL. Um, so data has weight. Um, it, it actually takes real work to move it from place to place. And uh, so what you really want to do is be able to, you know, move your data to some centralized location and then operate on it when it's there. And so the reason that DBT um, has historically been exclusively focused on SQL is that that was the language that the major cloud data platforms primarily used. You look at BigQuery, Snowflake, Redshift, like these were the the big platforms when we were uh, getting started that that mattered. Um, and if you wanted to use those, you used SQL. And now that's changing. Every one of these platforms are, uh, I know for a fact, um, Snowflake, BigQuery, Databricks, they are, they're all releasing like native uh, capabilities to to uh, you know operate in non SQL languages. So from DBT's perspective, we it's it's not that hard for us to support functionality that the data platforms inherently expose. We're we're a layer on top of the data platforms, and you know if if they had had Python natively back in 2016, we probably would have you know built it then. Makes sense. Well. On, on the topic of moving with the direction that analytics engineers are, are taking you, and frankly, I, I, not that I have all the experience in the world, but I, I know no other way of building a company than moving with the needs of your core user group and, and your ICP. But um, moving with those needs, what are the areas that 
have percolated within this group? What are the areas that you're really excited about that you, that you see as uh, uh, critical to, to enabling the analytics engineers of tomorrow? Gosh, it's a great question. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to I'm happy to go all over the place there. Um, it's funny. It's not actually a, a question that I often get asked on, on podcasts. So I'm great. To, I'm like excited to have the opportunity to talk about it. That's what we try to do. We try to stump the chop. That's the main goal of this podcast. Nice. Nice. Really make you think here, Tristan. No softballs. We don't have any softballs on this podcast. All right? <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. How do you build first class analytics engineering infrastructure uh, without having the capabilities of the kind of data teams that Uber and Airbnb and Pinterest and companies like this popularized in, in the 2010s. Um, because if you can afford hundreds of data platform engineering headcount, uh, then like, yeah, you can build some good stuff, but we, we want the rest of uh, the world to, to have access to this too. So um, we really care about uh, fantastic orchestration um, a lot of orchestration today is fundamentally a layer on top of cron. Um, it is, you know, invoke this pipeline on a schedule. Um, and that is, uh, kind of, I mean, and, and that's how, that's how DBT cloud works too. Um, not, not like casting any aspersions here, but, but I think that once you move towards a more framework type of world where like the the framework that you're writing you're expressing all this in actually understands what it is that you're expressing then you can start to do more powerful things you can start to actually uh express uh declaratively what the outputs are that you would like you know i would like this table to be uh fresh as of uh you know th this window as opposed to i would like this job to kick off on this schedule um so there's there's a lot uh I think that is that is really interesting from an orchestration perspective. Can I pause you? Can I pause oh, you? Oh yeah, sure, sure, sure. I, I want to chew on that for a second. I'm not going to go too detailed here because I I want to not like. So there's a couple PMs on our team who will be very upset if I burst their bubbles. Okay, so you don't have to go too deep. But um, what was what was interesting from what I parsed from you just said, which I had not heard before, is, um, yeah, we we know of orchestrators that say I want to run this job at this point in time. What you had just said was, I want to get to this result yes. at this point in time. I want this table to be. If you think again about like the persona question, analytics engineers versus data engineers. Um, data engineers tend to be more technical. Analytics engineers tend to be more uh, tend to be closer to the business, and so it, there it is one of the reasons why SQL is a really natural fit for the analytics engineer persona, because it's declarative. You describe what the output should look like. And then there's this whole optimizer that's actually constructing the the best query plan for uh, your the, the the output that you're looking for. In the same way, you know, but whereas data data engineers tend to prefer more control, like more um, imperative languages. Um, so in the same way that with schedulers, you can say like, "Hey, please do these things," um, or you can say declaratively, "Here's the output that I'm looking for." I think that that is more aligned with the analytics engineer persona. It's interesting because I, I think we we would see a similar pattern in our use cases where, yes, it seems there are folks on the team that are more in a give kind of position, the data engineers that work upstream that are delivering data into some location, and then the receiver uh, the receiver group being potentially analysts or data scientists, analytics engineer, maybe being somewhere in between that is more results oriented in a way, you know, the, the folks upstream want to make sure that jobs start at a particular time and, and they're running efficiently and, um, are, are pulling in data as expected. And then the recipient group being more oriented that results arrive at, at the, um, at the, the right time and are complete as, as they define it. Um, it's a very, it's a it's an interesting it's an interesting um, uh, characteristic for an, an orchestrator because it, that seems like a very it's a it, it seems to leave a lot on the orchestrator to decide how to run to get to the result 
uh, that you declare as opposed to um, describing how you want the process to start. That sounds like a uh, a hard problem to solve. Is that that's an area that you're spending a lot of resources thinking about? Uh, it's an area that we're we're very interested in. It's it's m more like an uh, you know you, you asked a question originally. Uh, what are the things that we think need to improve uh, for for the analytics engineer in the coming years? I think this is one of them. Uh, we're still in the early stages of like like you said, it's it's a non trivial shift to make, um, and and we're still in the early stages there. But I, I but I, I think that there's no way in which in five years we're all invoking a bunch of stuff on a cron tab. Um, that's like not that's not how that's going to go. Do you have a a nice marketing term that we can use to describe this new no way no. that we want orchestrators to work no uh uh we, we we will in the future but but we do not yet um the there's there's other stuff that's like very um so as as you see the proliferation of the modern data stack um y you know inevitably there's there's lots of companies and, and teams who use it for kind of the use cases that it was intended for, which are kind of uh, interactive analytics, like asking a question, getting a dashboard, you know, this kind of kind of important, but not mission critical uh, use cases. They're like internal focused, like, uh, you know, BI type use cases. And, th but, but inevitably some, Tales of the distribution will use um, we, we use technologies in ways that you don't anticipate, and so we had never anticipated that um, JetBlue would use DBT to uh, deliver real time reporting to their gate agents to tell people where to get their connecting flight. Like, never anticipated that in a million years, and. Uh, but but what happens when you start seeing these types of use cases happen is that like the operational characteristics of the systems that you help customers build like matter a tremendous amount, and that's not just like okay you have to make sure that things are working correctly there's high availability but you we also have to make sure that you know that the this is a real data product it has to be plugged into the same monitoring systems that JetBlue has for their other, uh, you know, live products. They, it needs to have the same kinds of escalation pathways that, you know, comp you know large companies have very uh, regimented requirements for escalation pathways to different levels of hierarchy inside their organizations. And they, they all do it through, you know, uh, systems like Datadog and PagerDuty and things like this. And so we, we care a lot about um, as DBT becomes increasingly mission critical infrastructure to to plug into this type of uh, this type of stuff that again i just named two different things we could we could talk about this forever like i, I care about a lot about the development experience um the dbt for a long time has been accessible to pretty technology forward users um who were like willing to install a bunch of stuff and learn a bunch of new skills um increasingly that will be something that you can just an experience that you can just give to uh, an, a new member of your team who doesn't know how to use the command line or Git, or, um, and they can, they can have uh, as uh, wonderful of an experience as, as you did when you, you knew all of these uh, magic incant incantations. So I, I have two questions. And as I typically do, I really want to ask both at the same time, but I'm, Enforcing a lot of discipline here to tease them out. So, first question: um, You mentioned before uh, business intelligence applications. You never want to go to uh, integration services. You never want to build that. Um, why? And you know, how hard will you draw that line? And you know, what if all the analytics engineers out there tell you we need it? You know, what what, uh, what guides your your the boundaries that you're setting here? Yeah. Okay. Um... I mean, partially, I've I've built products that do both of those things in the past, and it's really hard work. And I actually just it's not something that uh, I am personally excited to do again. Like, God bless all the people out there who are moving data and creating charts and, and dashboards. Um, 
I'd, I'd much rather let them do what they're good at. Um, the, uh, you, you asked a question about, um, about analytics engineers and what they need. So one of the things that I really love about our ecosystem and, and, you know, maybe it's just because we're early on in the development of this ecosystem, or maybe it's, maybe we'll be able to keep it like this. Um, but it is very focused on modular solutions and constructing best of breed technology stacks. Um, so it is a feature that DBT does not do data movement. That means you can use any of your, you know, data ingestion tooling with DBT. Um, it's a feature that DBT does not have a BI tool. It means you can use any BI tool with DBT. And that's what you see. Like DBT is increasingly a standard way to do data transformation in a very heterogeneous technology environment. Um, and so that there's a lot of questions about, well, internally, we have a lot of questions about, you know, where are the edges of what, we should be responsible for. And um, we we take it very seriously that like the less we try to do, the better. Um, we, we really um, love trying to solve um, customer problems through um, a solution and ecosystem approach as opposed to like uh, trying to like launch a new uh, service that competes with five other existing things and try to take market share. Like that's just not how we work. It's not how really the modern data stack ecosystem works though, at least today. Very related, but, um, as your community grows and the amount of voices in the analytics engineering, um, space increases, how do you gauge what the community wants and, and are there concrete things that processes that you're finding yourself experimenting with now or, or laying out or things that work really well, that helps you keep track of what folks are asking for and make sure that, that you are building in the, in the direction that the market is, uh, is moving. It's a, it's a very, very big question. And I don't know that we, um, I don't know that we have a perfect answer here. Um, we, we have a community team that has eight people on it. Um, two of those people are, um, advocates, community advocates who like their, uh, reason for, for being at the company is to, um, bring the company and the community closer together, like build personal relationships, um, know when, uh, you know, a new meetup. Uh, needs a speaker and know who the perfect speaker is for that meetup and, you know, et, et cetera. These kinds of connections happen all the time in the community. We've crossed 30,000 people in uh, DBT Slack. And, you know, in the early days when there's, you know, a couple hundred, a couple thousand people in there, if you had feedback, you just popped into, you know, popped into Slack and you just said what you thought in your feedback. But there's enough humans in there that that's, that's not always as effective uh, as as it used to be. So, you know, we'll we'll probably do um, we'll probably do some more intentional things to try to fill that gap moving forward. So, we'll probably have a community advisory board that will you know have rotating membership. And um, I, I um, want to find ways to continue to be engaged personally. Um, you know, I used to pop into issue comments. I used to pop into Slack threads and, and just hang out. Um, I, I do that less often than I used to, um, mostly because I don't, I don't actually know that people want the CEO to just kind of be watching over their shoulder as they like give feedback on the product. If I don't like have a personal relationship with them. Um, so I don't know. We're we're kind of like growing up as a community, and we're we're having to um, figure out all these much more uh, intentional ways to do things that used to kind of happen just naturally without having to think about it. As another practitioner in the space, I can say 
I, I don't know if there's a single other solution out there where I've met as many rabid fans <laughs> and uh, proselytizers as, as DBT. So you've done Thank something you. right. And you've uh, enabled a lot of people to um, uh, enjoy their their work a lot more than they otherwise would have without without your solution. So um, I'm sure it's it's uh, rewarding to see that difference. And um, we're certainly excited to see the different directions of the product and um, a small shameless plug. But we did just roll out our, our own great DBT integration. So we'll be yeah ri riding your coattails a little bit there. Um, but uh, uh, no, I appreciate uh, in seriousness what we've done for the the analytics community and excited about what's coming next for you all. Awesome. Thank you. Tristan, so as we wrap up today, um, give us uh, how people can reach out to you. you know, do you have a blog, Substack, LinkedIn? Um, and then are you going to be at any upcoming conferences soon? I will be at Snowflake's conference uh, and I will be at Databricks conference soon. Um, I am on Twitter as JT Handy, and um, I, I write every other week on Substack at um, roundup.getdbt.com. So I uh, would love, would love, uh, you know, certainly subscribe or, or follow me, but more like say hi. Like uh, if you want to pop into DBT Slack, like feel free to DM me and tell me what you've got going on, who you are, and, and how you found your way here. Well, Tristan, thanks again for joining the Mad Data Podcast. Really appreciate your time and hope to get up to Philadelphia soon. Here it's a great place.